It's hard to imagine the history of the last two centuries without photographs. It's through the photographer's lens we're able to see another time, another place. At the turn of the 20th century, three very different photographers worked and lived in the inland northwest. Charles A. Libby, Frank S. Matsura, and Frank Palmer. Charles Libby photographed Spokane at a time of great change. For six decades, Libby and his son Charles Jr. documented the city's rapid growth. It's impossible to imagine Spokane's early history without visualizing a Libby photograph. In the Okanagan Valley, photographer Frank Matsura, a Japanese immigrant, was befriended by a community of cowboys, miners, merchants, and Native Americans. In a time when portraits were stiff, formal affairs, Matsura's photographs seemed to capture a more authentic image of his friends and neighbors. Then there's Frank Palmer, whose love of nature is captured in his beautiful hand-painted photographs. Palmer's exotic wilderness photographs were used as postcards by the Spokane Chamber of Commerce to promote tourism in the inland northwest. This is Palmer's wife showing off her crop of enormous potatoes. Join us now as we explore the photography of Charles A. Libby, Frank S. Matsura, and Frank Palmer. Hello, I'm Don Hamilton. I'm a working commercial photographer here in Spokane, Washington, which means I'm following in the footsteps of Charles A. Libby, one of Spokane's first commercial photographers. Close your eyes for a moment. Imagine Spokane in 1910. What you see is a Libby photograph. Charles and his son Charles Jr. created a remarkable document of early Spokane. No other Spokane photographer took as many pictures over as long of a period as Charles Libby. By the time he retired in 1962, Libby had worked for over six decades. He photographed four presidents and left more than 200,000 negatives. For Libby, the early 1900s was a very exciting time to be a photographer. New technologies like halftones allowed photographers to publish their work in books, newspapers, and advertisements. This created a new demand for commercial photography, a form that Libby would wholeheartedly embrace. Charles Augustus Libby was born in Olympia, Washington in 1879. After his father's death in 1898, he moved with his family to Spokane at age 19. It was his older sister, Addie, who taught Libby photography. An accomplished photographer in her own right, Addie had opened a portrait studio in downtown Spokane, where she employed her teenage brother as her assistant. Under Addie's instruction, Charles learned the craft of portrait photography, but he wanted to branch out. New lighter weight field cameras and half-tone printing opened up the exciting world of commercial photography for Libby. In his spare time, he started taking photographs of Spokane Falls, Manitou Park, downtown Spokane, and various businesses. He saw this great potential to go out and do commercial photography and go out and take scenic landscapes and um, pictures of businesses and buildings. In 1902, Libby broke away from Addy and started his own photography business. And while he started by setting up a portrait studio, he actually made a reputation for himself by shooting outside of it. He advertised himself as a, quote, commercial photographer who will bring his camera to you. His timing was perfect. Spokane at the turn of the century was really a bustling community. 
and Libby as a commercial photographer was in the right place at the right time. City Fathers really promotionalized expansion and the benefits of the community. Spokane was kind of a central hub for all of these rural industries that were going on. So mining in Stevens and Okanagan County and also over in Idaho. You had logging and agriculture, agricultural groups from like the Palouse would come up and purchase all of their materials in Spokane. And it was just, it was a big supply city um, as well as um, kind of the central business district for the region. It really was the jewel of the Northwest. Spokane was booming. As new buildings and businesses were being built, Libby was there to document it. The ability to print photographs in publications and newspapers and brochures was new at the time, and so that idea of being able to take a picture of your business as part of your advertisement was definitely appealing to many business owners. As a commercial photographer, Libby produced every type of image from automobiles to zoo creatures at the Manitou Park. He took countless photographs for these businesses and word of mouth got out that he was really passionate about um, his work and so one business would hire him and they would show the photographs to their friends and their friends on businesses and they'd be like, oh you should come and take pictures of my storefront. He, he was involved in every type of, of commercial photograph, whether it was automobiles, uh, commercial construction, industrial development. He was really called upon to photograph the development of Spokane. Charles Libby was fascinated by new technology and machines, especially automobiles. In the early 1900s, Spokane was rapidly changing from a culture of the horse to that of the motor car. And buying a new car was a big darn deal. Libby shot hundreds of photographs of new owners and their fabulous machines. So getting an automobile was a big deal these pictures of families standing in front of their new automobile in front of their house. Photos were also taken of the dealerships that sold the cars and the gas stations that provided the fuel. And he not only took pictures of families that would buy new cars, but also dealers when they'd sell a car. So they have these pictures of rows of automobiles in front of Coeur d'Alene Park or over on Riverside Avenue with the courthouse in the background. And if a company bought a fleet of vehicles, Libby would get a call to photograph the proud occasion. Libby also photographed automobile races, auto touring, and automobile shows. One of my favorite Libby photographs was shot right behind me here in the lobby of the Davenport Hotel. It was of automobiles being brought in from the railroad level and down ramps to the floor below. Libby showed up for the wrecks too. He took thousands of photographs of crashed cars and derailed trains for insurance companies. At that time, automobile accidents really needed to be documented. And Libby, of course, as a commercial photographer, was the first person that somebody would call. I'm in the presence of Libby's actual camera equipment, here at the Mac, under the watchful eyes of the curator. I can't believe my great good fortune to be able to lay my hands on Libby's actual machines. 
Believe it or not, Libby's photography equipment was considered field gear. It was lighter than most of the studio cameras, but it was still a lot of heavy equipment to haul around. For example, in the beginning, Libby shot on individual glass plates like this one. They were heavy, um, very, very heavy. So early on in photography, you don't get a lot of images because you're lugging around 12 glass plates. So that's actually quite a bit of weight. And glass plates are shot in the size that the print is going to be. So if you wanted to take an 8x10 photograph, you would shoot with an 8x10 glass plate. As the technology changed, Libby evolved into using the lighter plastic nitrate negatives. Libby was meticulous in how he documented his photographs. He would individually number each photograph on the negative in his own handwriting. He thought a lot about the process and thought about how he as a photographer was going to document his own work. Libby experimented in how he wanted to sign his negatives. Sometimes you'd see Libbyograph or Libby Photo, and other times it might be signed Chaz Libby or C.A. Libby. Libby's ledgers were equally detailed. For example, April 9, 1924, image number 25630-640, Rotary Club of Spokane. <laughs> image number 25641, the Chamber of Commerce Executive Committee. Because of Libby's detailed numbering system, people still remember being able to go to Libby's studio to order a photograph taken decades earlier. He individually numbered his photographs. The ledgers would correspond with these numbers. So if you had a photograph of a luncheon, for instance, with the women's club, there might be five photographs and he would have them all listed and he would have the women's club and how much they paid for the photograph and what size the photograph they ordered, whether they paid for it or not. Many of Libby's photographs were used by the Chamber of Commerce as color postcards to showcase Spokane. Well, Charles Libby really captured the essence of an urban community. Street scenes, which were often utilized for colored postcards, which are very prominent in, in the teens and twenties. The type of images that people wanted to showcase their community. They were proud of Spokane, and I think Charles Libby especially had a pulse on what would sell. In 1905, Libby married Gretchen Schusler. Their only child, Charles A. Libby Jr., was born two years later. When Libby's son was a young man, he joined the business and the name was changed to Libby and Son Photography. Charles Libby and his camera seemed to be everywhere. He was hired to photograph special occasions, parades, visiting dignitaries, eloquent Davenport dinners, and pictures at Natatorium Park. No job was too big or too small. Whether it was photographing new home appliances or the interstate fair, Libby was there. And as Spokane's skyline changed and grew, Libby photographed it. Libby and his son worked extremely hard, seven days a week. Especially on weekends, if there was a picnic or uh, some type of convention at the Davenport Hotel, a gathering at one of the many lakes around Spokane, Washington, the photographers would go out, especially around lunchtime, dinner time, take a picture, uh, run back to the studio, develop some copy prints, take them back out to the occasion, 
and try to get some sales for individuals who are included. For many years, Natatorium Amusement Park was a popular hometown destination. Libby was often on site taking tourist photos and postcards of people on amusement rides. All the rides, Jack Rabbit, uh, you name it, Libby was on site taking photographs and whether it was for his own interests or a commercial interest, he was on the scene. Libby would go out to Liberty Lake to photograph groups of picnickers using this Kodak panoramic camera. The camera was loaded with an 8 inch by 10 foot roll of film. The panoramic camera used a clockwork drive to turn the camera while at the same time pulling the film. The camera needed five seconds to pan from one side of the group to the other. Generally, there was at least one prankster who'd try to run behind the group from one side to the other to get in the picture twice. Panoramic photography was a new thing and for a commercial photographer that's a really big selling point if you can say to a client hey you have a company picnic coming up we could take a picture of the entire employee picnic and all of them gathered in one long big stretch so he quickly adopts the new Kodak technology to take these long sweeping pictures and um, he, he's very excited about these new things and wants to try them out. In 1927, Spokane's Feltz Field was chosen as the finish line for the national air races. The aviation craze was in full swing across the country. Airplanes were exciting and new, and aviators were seen as celebrities. And it was a huge tourist attraction, and both Libbies were in the thick of it. Spokane's mayor, Major Jack Fancher, and the Chamber of Commerce helped sponsor the races. The main event was the transcontinental air race from New York City to Spokane with a $10,000 prize for the winner. 24 pilots entered the race. They hired Charles Libby and his son to shoot the photography for the event. For six days, some 90,000 people showed up for the air races in Spokane. Each day, over 36,000 people packed the grandstands alone. The sheer amount of cars that were in the parking lot, the fact that Libby took pictures of the parking lot um, just to show the amount of people that was there. Libby and his son shot numerous photos of famous aviators in their planes. They also shot from the air with Charles Libby Jr. venturing out onto the wing. The winner that year of the transcontinental air race was Charles Speed Holman. He traveled from New York City to Spokane in 19 hours and 42 minutes. In 1933, construction began on the eighth wonder of the world. Libby and Charles Jr. were contracted to photograph the complete process of building the Grand Coulee Dam from start to finish. It was a five-year project that required their continuous presence on the construction site. The Grand Coulee Dam project for Washington State at the time was a huge deal. Um, it was a big economic draw in an area that was drying up with the depression and um, Libby getting the contract to document the building of this huge dam. Was... 
Livy and his son um, go out and they start documenting the way this dam is constructed. So there's countless pictures of dump trucks dumping um, all of the soil that they're digging up will help prepare for the site as well as um, the different buildings that get built up because there's temporary cities that are built for this dam. And so you get this sense of how monumentally large this project is. In 1934, President Roosevelt came out to visit the Grand Coulee Dam construction site. Many national photographers are in tow. But Charles Libby Jr. has the advantage. He knows the construction site inside and out. Libby Jr. sets his camera up at the perfect location to capture the ideal photograph of FDR, the one that would be syndicated in newspapers worldwide. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, Libby did not photograph bread lines or people in poverty. That was Dorothea Lange's job. Rather, he worked in a room like this, photographing well-heeled patrons that could pay him well. A lot of his photographs are what his clients want to see, and not necessarily documenting all aspects of society. Interestingly enough, in the 30s, he's taking pictures of new cars and new washing machines and advertisements for different kinds of home equipment, such as ovens and things like that. He is a commercial photographer and he's a photographer for hire, so he is not out documenting like a photojournalist would. As we know, Charles Libby made his living as a commercial photographer. He didn't fancy himself a historian or a documentarian, and yet he played the essential role for six decades of documenting Spokane's evolution. Well, there's one Charles Libby image which shows horses for sale, and it's showing the backside of these horses. And the contrast between that image and the family that just acquired an automobile out at Manitou Park. So there really was a documentary aspect to the work they did. The Charles A. Libby Collection at the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture is one of the greatest assets from a historical perspective that we have in our community. Our next photographer, Frank Matsura, was a Japanese immigrant who lived in the Okanagan Valley in the early 1900s. Matsura would have fit right into our culture today of Instagrams and selfies. He took photographs like a family member would, with a real personal connection, many times including himself. Frank Matsura was well liked in the Okanagan Valley. He was gregarious and full of fun, and seemed to get along with everyone from all walks of life. His camera knew no social barriers. Cowboys, farmers, miners, Native Americans, women, rich or poor, they all came under his spell. Frank Sakai Matsura was born in Tokyo, Japan in 1873 to a samurai family that could trace their ancestry back to the 1600s. For generations, the Matsura family was powerful and influential. But by the time Frank came along, times had changed. Samurai were no longer powerful, and to make matters worse, he was orphaned at a young age. Matsura went to live with his uncle's family, who ran a Christian girls' school in Tokyo. Frank found himself surrounded by intellectuals who influenced him. In his early 20s, he moved to Yokohama for five years to study photography and English. 
Rinjo Shimuka, considered Japan's father of photography, had a studio there. He was part of the Shimuka social circle, father of photography in Japan. At age 28, looking for adventure, Frank Matsura packed up his camera, grabbed his passport, and sailed for America. In the fall of 1903, Frank Matsura arrived in Konkanali, Washington, in Okanagan County. He was hired by Jess Dillabout to work at the Elliott Hotel as a laundryman and general roustabout. You know, they need a cook, a washer, a roustabout, somebody to just help out with the chores. He answered the call. At that time, Okanagan County was considered one of the last frontiers in the American West. People were still packing six guns, but at the same time, you had the automobile and the incandescent light. The Elliott Hotel was the biggest building in town. It was the headquarters for the stages and mining men that were coming in, and I think Frank was right in the middle of it. Matsuro lived in the back of the hotel. The Delabas kind of adopted him and treated him like kind of a big brother to their young family. And there's a lot of pictures of the Dillaba kids with Frank. Matsura soon began taking photographs in his spare time and developing them in the laundry room of the hotel. Early on, his name starts appearing in the Okanagan Record newspaper. At first, Matsura was referred to as the Little Jap. Before long, he becomes Mr. Frank Matsura, the esteemed photographer who is taking wonderful photographs of our community. The bleeding edge of manifest destiny out here. The 1880s saw anti-Chinese riots in, in Seattle. There was a lot of uh, animosity, xenophobia, of the fear of uh, the immigrants taking a job that rightfully belonged to a white man. But Frank and his camera seemed to break down social barriers. His gregariousness and his ability to be at, at, at all levels of social strata. Well, he was friends with everybody. Uh, it made no difference whether Indian, white, moneyed, you know, poor. He, he, didn't, you know, he just got along with everybody. Uh, he was much more engaged at a direct level with the people of the community uh, that uh, he was working with, uh, that he would see on a regular basis, uh, that uh, he was friends with. That distinction right there tells me about Frank Matsura, uh, that uh, he uh, lived in the communities. Uh, he was a part of the community. And so with that, his engagement uh, with the people that he was photographing, it was much more personal. Uh, there wasn't this removal. Frank Matsura also had a special connection with the Native Americans. Here was a person who looked a lot like them in skin color and eyes and did not condescend to them. In fact, offered them um, the Japanese humility and, and hospitality and took note of their material culture and, and their families and visited their families at their houses. But by no means, I think, was he trying to document the Native people in a way that was trying to capture them before they disappeared. This 
by no means was the intention of Frank Matsura. You could see that. He allowed the people to be who they were in that time, uh, whether it was proudly wearing their traditional regalia or the, the clothes that they wore out on the ranch with their big Angora chaps uh, and hats and cuffs. He was very conscious of who they were in that moment in time. By 1906, Frank Matsura was selling his work. He took out a full page ad in the Okanagan record advertising his souvenir postcards of the local scenery. Frank's photographs were also featured in a booster edition of the newspaper, headlined Konkanali, Pride of the Okanagan. Matsura was making a name for himself. A local newspaper stated, Mr. Frank Matsura, the local photographer, has the thanks of the record office for some excellent pictures of local scenes. Mr. Matsura takes a great interest in photography and does credible work. We joke that he must have been part mountain goat because the places where he took pictures and they're up on mountain tops. <laughs> Frank Matsura was a gentleman, well-educated, and spoke fluent English. He actually translated one of the horticultural texts that was used in the high schools, and he translated it into Japanese and sent it back to Japan. He wrote a letter to the editor or an op-ed in the Konkanelli Register on the role of women in Japanese society. And to read those, he's got this impeccable command of academic English. Matsura's photographs connected with people. Unlike the more rigid portrait photography reflective of the times, Matsura's photography was more spontaneous, candid, and fun. It was kind of like an iPhone. It, was, it could be there all the time. And, uh, and people were becoming more and more at ease. It wasn't viewed as a, a sanctimonious event where you've got to drop everything and, and assume certain rigorous chin out posture. It was a moment to have fun and then relive that moment again and again when you had the print in your hand and that was something a lot of people had never experienced. Frank seemed to be everywhere. He was the life of the party, the town clown. He was the instigator of all the fun stuff going on. I don't think he ever missed a ball game. He uh, never missed a parade. Here's somebody who can take a picture and you can have an instant memory of your most recent town celebration. No event would be complete without a Frank Matsura photograph. Like this one taken of the king and queen of the winter carnival. One of the negatives I was just working on and I got zooming in on that photo and found a banner across 2nd Avenue. And on that banner was, was looked like welcome, spelled out in, in fireworks. And on, on the end of that string of fireworks by the, down by the W was a man in uh, oriental dress and he's lighting the fireworks. Matsura was known for his whimsical nature and his sense of humor. Even Mikey, a dog belonging to Matsura's friend Judge Brown, turns up in a variety of shots, including studio shots, with pipe and glasses. We've got one picture of a sledding party that took place on Pine Street. There's just people lined up on the snowbank and kids on sleds coming down and the school in the background with the windows half open. Just this incredible portrait of kids in knickerbockers. Matsura had a way of capturing the essence of people, drawing in the viewer. The one that I, I'm always drawn to 
is a photograph of an elderly Native American woman carrying wood down the main street, I assume, of Okanagan, and she's walking down the street in the snow. I think for some people they might think it, it, it speaks to the plight of, of Native people, and I surely could see that. But that's not how I read the photograph. Uh, when I see the photograph, I think of all the grandmothers and great-grandmothers, my aunties, uh, the women, the strong women uh, that I've had the privilege uh, to know in my life, to learn from, uh, that important element of our culture, that matriarchal element that uh, reveals the strength, uh, the determination, uh, that, that component that, that holds us together. In 1907, Frank Matsura moved 20 miles from Conconelli to Okanagan. He opened up his own photography studio downtown near First and Pine. It's always something happening outside of his photography studio because it was just right across from the Bureau Hotel and then down the street was the Okanagan Hotel. And at the same time, you had the steamboat coming in two or three times a week. So that was kind of the main hub of Okanagan at the time. Frank's photography studio sold postcard souvenirs by the thousands and Japanese curiosities. There was also a small portrait studio in the back. He just was everywhere. Of course, his shop was right there where the steamboats came in and the stages came in, and, and so he, he was just right in the thick of things. One Sunday, Matsura photographed a group of Okanagan bachelors sitting on a hitching rail outside the pool hall. Because he too was a bachelor, he took another shot, including himself. Like every photographer I've ever known, Frank Matsura loved his toys. He was always adding to his equipment inventory. To stay current, he once bought a modern camera for $315. That doesn't sound like much, but it was a small fortune at the time. He was taking pictures of the elected officials and important people and out and about and taking pictures of people digging ditches and, you know, doing hard work and across the board, he just seemed to, to be there. In 1906, the Okanagan Record reported that, quote, an automobile has, for the first time, made its way safely into the county, and no cowboy has roped and branded it, nor has an accident befallen it. Before long, a delegation from the Great Northern Railroad Company arrived to inspect the work for a new railroad line. Matsura had been hired to document the construction of the first railroad into the area. In 1907, Matsura was selected as the official photographer for the irrigation works during the building of the Conconelli Dam. He will make a series of pictures taking views each month, thus showing the progress of the work, reported the Okanagan record. Many of Frank's photos were used for civic boosterism. A civic boosterism was very big at this time, and every community was trying to put on their best face to visitors and inviting other people to their community functions. The Okanagan was the backside of the moon, and it was just developing, and people wanted to, to get the word out about this area. His pictures were used by the Great Railroad and by at all these expositions that they were having, and. Of course, his postcards went everywhere, so he was influential in getting the word out. 
Native Americans would travel a great distance to have their photographs made at Frank's studio. It's evident to me that there's a real personal connection that seems to exist uh, between he and, uh, and the uh, people that uh, came into his studio that, uh, that w would sit and, and have their photographs taken. It seemed very natural. It would be in some ways as if it was a family member uh, that took these photographs with that same sort of kind of connection. In one photograph, Matsura captures Chief Chilliwist Jim on his horse in downtown Okanagan. There is something remarkable uh, that I find with uh, his photograph of Chilliwist Jim. Uh, he's on his horse. The backdrop behind him is uh, the watch and jewelry store. And against the store fronts are three gentlemen that are non-native and a dog. And they're all kind of looking uh, in the direction, not really at Chilowis Jim, but at Frank Matsura. You can tell because he must have been in the middle of the street uh, with his camera set up. And it, it, it just, it's not so much about the photograph as much as all the things that were happening uh, at that moment. To entertain themselves, Frank and his friends set up skits and dressed up for the camera. You know, people didn't have TVs, and so they made their own fun. And they would do these skits and little plays and stuff. Just outrageous sometimes <laughs> with props and hats and goofy stuff. Doing crazy things with playing cards. Just guys pointing guns at each other and you know, lighting each other's cigars or pipes. And, and men and women both. Matsura owned a multi-image camera that could take many small thumbnail sized photos on one sheet of film. These stamp photos were inexpensive and fast to produce, so his gang of friends could have fun and get creative. He was a clown. <laughs> he was a, a comic and uh, had a great sense of humor. And... My favorite one, and they're all of Frank in different poses. He put on his own selfie. Tells me kind of what kind of a guy he was. I mean, he was just this debonair, laid back, Here, here's a picture of the back of my head kind of guy. <laughs> There is one skit where Matsura is in front of a firing squad. He's got himself in front of a firing squad, being shot. You know, and and he's, he's dressed for it. He's got uh, his, his shirt is torn. He's got a blindfold on. He's got blood pouring out of, his, out of a hole in his chest. That was just a skit they were doing that day. Matsura was just one of the guys. He often included himself in the photographs. He didn't have the professional distance, you might call it. I mean, he could be the first photo bomber, really. And so he wants a record of, these are my people. And he wants his people back in Japan to know his adopted people here in the Okanagan. Sudden death in Okanagan, the OMAC Chronicle reported. Sadly, on June 19, 1913, Frank Matsura's life was cut short by tuberculosis. He died suddenly of a lung hemorrhage while running to get help for a friend. Frank Matsura was only 39 years old. A shadow of sorrow was cast over the community early in the week by the sudden death Monday night of Frank S. Matsura the Japanese photographer who has been part and parcel of the city ever since its establishment seven years ago, the Okanagan Independent. The biggest funeral that Okanagan had ever seen. The Independent also reported, quote, Frank's place in Okanagan City will never be filled. 
he was held in high esteem of all who knew him. He was one of the most popular men in Okanagan and was known from one end of this vast county to the other. Our final photographer is Frank Palmer, who lived in Spokane in the early 1900s. Palmer called himself a scenic photographer who photographed nature's grandest scenes. His beautiful hand-painted photographs were used to attract tourists to eastern Washington and northern Idaho. Palmer's images included grand waterfalls, pristine lakes, and towering mountains. They capture the essence and spirit of turn-of-the-century Washington and Idaho. Frank Palmer came to Spokane from Atchison, Kansas in 1898. He ends up in Rathdrum, Idaho, and was also up in Stevens County at a point before coming to Spokane and settling in Spokane as a young man and photographer. Palmer's ledgers, which began in 1907, show that he had a large stock of photographs that were selling well. Some of his biggest clients were the boosters and promoters like the Chamber of Commerce and the railroads and steamship companies. So he's working with the railroads and the steamboat companies to kind of drum up business. And one of the ways he does that is he's contracted to produce 20,000 prints of the scenic view on this steamboat or on this rail, and, and he does it. And he, he's able to mass produce these prints as souvenirs. In 1910, Palmer noticed that he sold over 15,000 photographic postcards. Palmer was an avid outdoorsman. He and his wife Frances camped and took photos of their adventures. You get a really strong sense that he loved nature and he loved the scenery in Washington and Idaho. There's these incredible shots of waterfalls, of lakes, um, of these um, just unique geographic locations. Outdoor World and Recreation Magazine, headquartered in New York City, used some of Palmer's magnificent scenic photographs. Palmer also offered his clients something unique, color. He would painstakingly go in and paint these really vivid colors on sunsets on the lake or of these streams and waterfalls with this greenery and foliage around it. It's rather incredible. Although there is no actual documentation, Palmer and Francis apparently collaborated in the photography business. She is very involved in his career as a photographer. She works as an assistant for him, helping develop his photographs. She very much is the star of some of his photography. Many of Palmer's photographs highlight rural life in the inland Northwest. He was very interested in documenting the natural resources of the area. So there's these great pictures of apple orchards and his wife holding this bushel of potatoes that are just uh, enormous and him hand coloring those in to really give people a sense of what it looked like. There's these great pictures of a family 
posing outside of their log cabin. The incredible documentation of rural life. He just had a sense of how to take a photograph and give it a really timeless feel. One of his more iconic pieces is this picture of Curly Jim, who is a local a Spokane Indian. And he's in very classic Western dress outfit with a fringed um, vest. It becomes used. And so it's this contrast of, it's not just traditional garb, but them being and embracing a part of modern society and the everyday life. And I think Palmer really understood that. August 1409, sent to Grant L. Martin, Hunters, Washington, 100 postcards, town of Hunters, Washington, $3.50. Palmer traveled all over the Inland Northwest. In his 1908 ledger, he recorded that in that one year, he traveled 4,315 miles. Palmer dies in 1920 at age 40. Francis inherits his negatives and continues to sell prints into the 1930s. Palmer was very purposeful in the way he took photographs. Some photographers take thousands and thousands of pictures. His pictures seemed much more intentional. So he would take the time to set up the shot to get the perfect photograph. Through the photography of Charles Libby, Frank Matsura, and Frank Palmer, we have a unique window on the past of the Inland Northwest. We're so lucky that so much of their work survives. Today, these treasures are archived at the Museum of Arts and Culture in Spokane, at the WSU Special Collections, and at the Okanagan County Historical Society. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, I'm Don Hamilton.